let's create a pivotal impact. Friends in the industry. So before we get started today, I just wanted to highlight an observation that I continue to make within the transportation industry. And honestly, it's probably something that you've seen yourself. So I'm noticing more and more conversations taking place about what we as an industry need to do to help retain current staff. So for quite some time, there have been a ton of conversations about recruiting and busting at all these fancy bells and whistles that will ultimately attract top talent to your organization. So I'm excited to see more conversations taking place about what organizations need to do in order to keep their people. So a huge component of retention is honestly culture and investing the time and resources it takes to establish and grow a culture that empowers its people to ultimately create a feeling of fulfillment and that they belong. So I'm Josh Annaberry, your, your host here at the Truck Focus Podcast, and our mission here is simple. We're connecting transportation industry leaders to the industry to help create a pivotal change. So as our industry continues to think outside the box on our approach to retaining top talent, it's extremely important to focus on your retention efforts during your recruiting process and how your onboarding journey will ultimately play a huge role in the top talent you're looking to hire to stay employed within your organization. So this leads us to today's conversation as I'm super excited to have a great conversation with Stephanie Carruth, owner of Minds for Matter, an industry leader that is having that I honestly have a ton of respect for. And she's really focused on bridging the gaps in the transportation industry. During our conversation, Stephanie walks us through some of the must do's when an organization is developing an onboarding program, but also what can be done to help retain top talent within the existing organization. So I encourage you to learn more about Minds for Matter by visiting Minds mindsformatter.com or checking them out on all major social media platforms. So before we get started in our interview today, I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you if this is the first time that you've ever checked out the Truck Focus podcast and to really welcome you to our community and to our dedicated community. Just want to continue to say thank you so much for taking the time to listen, but also to implement the knowledge shared in each episode to really improve yourselves and your industry through creating a pivotal impacts in our day-to-day -day interactions. So throughout the conversation, conversation today, a huge ask that I have is that you consider what you're learning, what you're hearing, and what can be applied in your place of business. If you think of something that's awesome, let me know in the comments or send me a note directly. And I just, again, I appreciate learning opportunities from our community. Also, if today does impact you, if our conversation has that impact, really, yes, I can do this. I ask that you share it out. Share out this episode to your network, like it, subscribe to the channel that you're listening to. And yeah, I'm just really excited for the impact today's conversation is going to have. Let's get to it. Stephanie, super excited for our conversation today. Um, I think there's different types of industry leaders. When we're talking transportation. Some people really care about different metrics. And something I felt you and I, we hit it off really fast on is the human element and the importance yeah. of people in industry. So when I kind of got that vibe right away, I'm like, okay, there's some serious potential here to create, a, I'd say a buzz in people's ears or if they're watching, this is exciting. And yeah, I'm just really grateful. I learned a little bit more about you from our initial call, spent a little time on your website. And I really admire leaders that I can tell truly do value people. It's not just a slogan on a, a sign, the hope to get more business. It's no, no, no. <laughs> Steph, I think that's really powerful. And I think just again, where our conversation will go today, it's really cool because the timeliness of it is really important. So again, I'm just super grateful you're here. So welcome. Great. Thank you. Absolutely. So kind of start us off. If you want to share your backstory, which I think is super fascinating and highlight where you got to today from that, maybe not birth, but industry specific stuff, which <laughs> again, I say that on purpose because again, I'm fascinated by your story. And I like that you've been able to really have a good, clear vision of where you're going as you navigate it through stuff. So why don't you kind of start us off with that? Okay, so perfect. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for uh, asking me to come on and join you. I'm really excited for our chat. And yes, we did have a really good uh, pre-call. So I'm looking forward to this. Um, so I'm a founder of a project management and consultancy firm called Minds for Matter. And we primarily service the transportation industry, but it's not the only industry we serve, but that is where my background is. Um, so I had a less traditional entrance into the industry than most. Um, but however, like many of us, I followed in the footsteps of family. Um, originally, it was just meant to be a stepping stone, though, kind of a, like a place filler, so to speak. Um, so actually, after I finished my master's degree, and it's in classical archaeology. I know, 
very applicable <laughs> to what I'm doing. <laughs> um, but I, I did love what I studied, uh, you know, really loved McMaster University where I attended for both my undergrad and my graduate degree. Um, great professors, just great people, really loved the campus. So I enjoyed my time in school. Um, but after that, I started working for my father at One for Freight. Uh, initially, I was in a safety and compliance administrator role and then quickly transitioned to an HR role, which was actually the first the company ever had. Prior to that, it was managed mainly through the leadership team. Um, the company had gone through a significant period of growth just prior to that. So the need for a fully fledged HR department was evident. Um, and then during that time, I actually did my HR designation as I was developing in the role, which was actually beneficial because I could employ the tactics and strategies and the different programming as I was learning it. So then after a few years and uh, several top fleet employer awards later, uh, my father and I actually came to the agreement that if we truly wanted to be this exceptional place for people to work, then having an HR manager with the same last name as two of the shareholders wasn't really fair and actually potentially stood as a barrier for team members to actually communicate any issues. So at that point, I transitioned to a role that we called research and development, but it was more of a cross-functional role between our sales and our operations departments. Essentially, I would take on new clients as they traveled through the sales funnel. I would test out the operational commitments that had been made, uh, worked out any kinks, because obviously those happen. <laughs> and then at, at that point, after a couple of weeks, I would write it into a procedure and then train it into the customer service and solutions teams for continued management. So, and I loved that role. And that was right in my wheelhouse. It was the crossover between policy and procedure development and actual hands-on operational work. And it was dealing with clients and it was training people. I got to still deal with the drivers, which was my favorite part of being in the carrier environment. And it, all in all, it, it was a really good um, kind of collaboration of my skills and my experience. Um, but over time, though, I did, I do think I grew a little bit restless and I constantly found myself questioning what's next, what else is there for me, you know, what is the next step in my career? And I knew that I was not going to be able to take a step up at One Per Freight. It's a very lateral organization um, and there's not much room for advancement in that way. Um, so rather than continuing to dwell on that and fighting that and trying to you know, create something that I could move into, um, I rather shifted my focus and started planning my next step. And this was in about mid 2019. And actually from there, I communicated and connected with a number of different people, you know, mentors, industry colleagues, uh, some old professors, of course, my father. <laughs> um, and then I quietly kind of started to plan my next move, including designing my passion project. Um, and I wasn't sure if I wanted to source out a new opportunity with a new employer that time or just go out on my own. Um, I think at that point, I still felt like I needed to have more, like a more robust resume. And I had that nagging feeling that like, nobody would take me seriously. But this ended up being completely unfounded and ridiculous and self-deprecating now that I think about it. Um, so as we navigated 2020, uh, I pumped the brakes a little bit on my plans, not wanting to you know, leave my secure employment when the world was in such turmoil. But I still incorporated in September of 2020, and I'm rather glad I took the time as I think the nature of my strategy evolved over that time. And I started to notice and consider certain employment trends and challenges that had been exacerbated by the pandemic. So over the next year, I kind of spent my time asking, how would Minds for Matter solve that? Or can I even solve that? And it really helped me to hone in on what purpose MFM would serve. Um, so, you know, also during that time, I developed a couple of strategic partnerships, which were really great, um, you know, looked at, looked for some opportunities, but I was also still working full time. And then I uh, finally gave my notice and went out completely on my own in October of 2021. And I've been working on Minds for Matter ever since. Good for you. Oh, Thank that's you. so powerful. This gets me so <laughs> excited. So, so many things that you hit 
I think are blind spots for just people in industry. And the biggest is opportunity. And I think a lot of times when, if it's, you grew up in the industry or it's, <laughs> you just didn't have the, maybe the ability to go get a something degree. So you're like, Hey, you know what, here's a different industry. Or if it's your second or third career coming into the industry far too often, people think that's it. I have my job. That's it. Yeah. You're a perfect testimonial or your story is a perfect testimonial of what is possible within industry mm-hmm. where compliance is a very broad term because in, in trucking, as you know, there's so many moving parts we have to be yeah. like follow the regulations with. So I can see the segue between compliance and HR, but then going from HR to operational sale with customer, building SOPs, really perfecting quote unquote processes I think that would be a really fun challenge because yeah. you're, again, I can speak through experience from an operational side and health and safety side, you are speaking different languages because yeah. just the impacts are very different. So good for you for being able to thrive in that place, but also realizing, okay, I don't want a ceiling. I don't want to say that's it. I guess I'm going to settle and I'm early thirties. This is it for another 30. Like, so I'm glad you recognize that because you still speak to opportunity in industry and where you've, where you started and where you're headed with Minds for Matter, I think is really encouraging too, especially to our listener base, because there's so many entrepreneurs out there trying to figure out what problems can I solve while overcoming imposter syndrome. Yeah. And what you shared too is a huge highlight. So again, I'll backtrack. When I first welcomed you on, I said, I get excited about your journey because it's so <laughs> empowering because you're like, okay, I recognize this in myself. No, I'm going to overcome that. And I think a lot of times people stop trying to do something different because of that exact fear. Oh, I'm not good enough for, oh, this isn't here quite yet. And you come up with phenomenal excuses that you end up believing when it's like, or you can just go for it. So taking the pandemic away that hindered a lot of people's plans, I know. I'm really proud of you. And I'm excited just to hear more about Minds for Matter and how you're really navigating in this space. And I just, again, from our listener standpoint, I really want people to be encouraged that yes, you can navigate through industry. It's an incredible industry and you're building a really prosperous life for yourself and your family. So I just, I really want to just celebrate that with you. I think that's really cool. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. And, and, you know, it it was, it's been a, it's been a journey. Um, I am incredibly thankful for the support of my better half and my parents, you know, um, I find that a lot of people in my position in the industry, right, may not get that same level of support from their family when they are making the decision to leave and pursue their own path. Um, But for me, it was the complete opposite. Um, You know, my father said, you know, when I left, it's, it's bittersweet that you're leaving. And I really enjoyed working with you. And I obviously want to continue that. But I'm proud of you. And I think that this is the next great next step. And Obviously, he supported me in everything that I do. So right. it's been really nice. And it's been, it's yeah, actually cool. made it a lot easier to, to, you know, take the plunge and finally do it. So, yeah. yeah. Hey, Josh here. Just a quick interruption of our conversation is I really encourage you to learn more about Minds for Matter by visiting their website, mindsformatter.com, and see how Stephanie can offer a ton of value for yourself as a person, but also for your organization that you work for. So I've included the link directly in the show notes. Let's get back to the episode. Yeah, which is nice too, because I, again, I'm a dad. You're, you're a parent, like you're a mom? I'm a dog mom. Okay, okay. So, well, it's, <laughs> and auntie, I love being auntie. <laughs> yeah, okay, that, that's really powerful too. So I have a 12-year-old and I now, oh, he's incredible. I am, yeah, I am really blessed. I'm, I have too many good things in my life for, this is just incredible. And when I think about my parenting style, I'm not perfect by any means, but I really do pride myself in trying to uplift his creativity, uplift his decision-making. So it's nice to know that your dad is able to do that because in a sense, it could have been inconvenient for him. It was a lot more convenient, I'm sure. No, just stay where you are. Keep rocking it. We got this. It's like, no, no, no. Let's (laughs) let's take the dad dream side and let's, okay, what's best for my kid? That's best for my kid. I'm going to roll with that. So I'm really just, again, there's just so many good things in your journey that really do encourage people. So I appreciate the fact that you shared that. And I'm glad, I'm grateful that you recognize that in your parents and in your spouse too. I think that's really important. Yeah. I'm, I'm exceptionally lucky in that respect. I have a lot of support. Good. Good. So before we dive too much further, Minds for Matter, how uh, do people learn more about you? Is it visiting the website, hopping on social? Where should people go? 
Um, so yeah, so I have a website. It's www.mindsformatter.com. Uh, and uh, active on social media as well. I, uh, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, but uh, so, and the other actually really interesting um, bit about my business is I've actually entered into a strategic partnership with Mohawk College Enterprises, which is the corporate subsidiary of Mohawk College. Um, and we are actually in the process of developing a series of courses that we are calling Essential Skills for Transportation Professionals. But it's really focusing more on the soft skills relating to the actual day-to-day -day operations, right? And how you grow as a person out and a leader outside of, you know, the traditional education that you may get either through work or through a supply chain program or something like that. And it's aimed at drivers, dispatchers, emerging leaders, even somebody, if there will be courses even for somebody who's just thinking about pursuing the industry and opportunities within the industry and, you know, just gaining some understanding of what's available, how to look for it. You know, what are the positions called? What do those position titles even mean? And what do those jobs entail? And how do you, and how can you market your skills to match? Because that's actually one of the biggest challenges that I felt, I think, coming out of university um, there, there was a moment in time where I approached the head of the graduate department at Master University and I asked him, you know, how do I market my skills that I've learned in this program outside of the institution? And he looked at me and he said, I, I can't help you with that. He had never written a professional resume before. He only had an academic CV. He, that's all he ever needed, right? And I realized that the majority of my mentors at that point were all in academia. So I had very little help making that transition from academia to private industry. And I think that's where my passion now lies, is that intersection of the two. And what I want to do is really look at how to bridge this gap more effectively like I said, I often find the educational programming and curricula don't accurately coincide with the day-to-day -day work environment, particularly when it comes to the transportation industry. So I think that there is opportunity there. And, you know, I've met a number of supply chain students and graduates who do not have direction nor any sort of familiarity with the realities of trucking in particular, which is quite troubling considering trucking plays such a predominant role in the North American supply chain and our overall economy. And we've seen that exacerbated, especially recently. So, you know, how do I focus my time and efforts on bridging that gap? Because I actually think that academia and private industry, particularly trucking, have a lot to offer each other. Trucking in particular has a lot to offer academia because there's a lot of opportunity for projects and like, you know, whether it's a capstone project, an MBA project, whatever the case, there's a lot for the, for students there to explore that hasn't been touched on in the past. And then on the other end, in, in the trucking industry, having that academic mindset, I think will help drive things like innovation and you know technology and looking at you know how we obtain our data and then what we do with it and how to implement those projects moving forward, which I feel like we're really missing right now. Yeah, there's a lot of guessing that goes on in our industry. And even though you could literally have five carriers doing the same thing, if they're not talking to each other, I don't know what he does. I don't know what he does. And one person's an operations manager. The other one's a supervisor or something or other. The other person's a totally different name. And it's very, yeah, there's a lot of guesswork based off of whoever owns that company or what language is brought over from different organizations. So tons of value there. How is that uh, I don't know if going is the right word, but how is that coming along? And what is there like an ETA on launch or are they already live? Uh, they should be live shortly. <laughs> okay, good, good. Um, definitely, it's definitely been a bit of a progress. I'm really thankful for the team at Mohawk uh, for their assistance and their support through this and their patience. One thing that I've noticed is that um, while I had all of the knowledge and the information available to me, putting that into a format that is, you know, exciting and engaging and, you know, actually, <laughs> you know, meets the learning objectives is a bit of a journey. So I've definitely learned a lot in that time. Um, you know, when I was at McMaster, I was a TA and I was given the opportunity actually to lecture in a number of the courses um, rather than just run tutorials. So I have that 
experience and I'm a pretty confident speaker. So that has definitely been a benefit to me going through this, but also, you know, trying to keep it interesting. Right. And I have to remember that things that I get excited about (laughs) other people might not find as exhilarating. (laughs) That's kind of where I'm at right now. But um, the first two courses are pretty much done. Um, I am really excited because we actually have a series of interviews with drivers and industry personnel that will be kind of plugged in with each of the modules. So I feel like that will help to engage um, new people coming into the industry even more. And the first two that I'm working on, um, one is kind of like an intro to industry. So it's going over um, the governing bodies and the applicable legislation and then what are the opportunities in trucking, right? How can you advance? Um, What are some designations that you can obtain or different training opportunities? And then also kind of exposing them to the industry organizations, because I think my growth and development was really supported by my involvement in things like the OTA and the PMTC and Trucking HR Canada and other groups like that, that really show the good side of the industry and it connects you with like-minded people and you know people who actually want to drive and affect real change so um unless you you know unless you're in the industry you don't really know that those things exist so i'm trying to kind of i'm trying to kind of advertise them a little bit earlier on and then the second course that will be out just after is actually called life on the road so it is more so for drivers Um, And it's basically that stepping stone between the mandatory entry level training program and, you know, their first day on the job. So it's what to expect as a driver, right? You know how to, you know how to operate the truck, you have your license, but actually working in that role, there's a little bit more involved. And, you know, in my time in HR, I noticed, and and I've seen this trend, you know, with other employers and other colleagues where, you know, young people come into the industry, they've just gotten their license, or it's their, you know, a second career path, whatever the case, they come into the industry, they're ready to go. And then a couple months into it, they realize this isn't for me. Right. So I'm kind of looking at how can I help to bridge that gap and, you know, increase that understanding and that comfort level to really help people understand what the realities are, um, but also what the benefits are to working in that type of position, right? We know trucking isn't for everybody, but it is for some people. Great. Yeah, that's exciting. And I like that you went peer to peer. So when you have champions of industry speaking, like the benefits and the challenges, it's a lot easier to be received than if it's, sorry, your title is what? I can't even pronounce the fanciness of it. And yeah, so that's really smart. And yeah, I'm an advocate. I love PMTC. Shout out to Mike and Matt. And I'm sure you know Kim too. And yeah. they're a great, great, great group. OT is great. And um, yeah, so I think that's really exciting. And I think from an innovative standpoint, when you're with like-minded people, you can actually pull on years of experience, but also fresh, like, well, I've only been here for six months and I want to get involved, hunger and passion. So there's like a lot you can pull on there, but yeah, you're right though. When like, I I'm pretty active on social media and I, I pay attention to who's complaining and who's complimenting and normally who's complaining. You're always going to read, I've been doing this for 5 million years and X and it's like, okay, but I don't think the future of transportation is that. I think the future of transportation is shifting sectors. It's shifting. Like, can you eliminate long haul together? No. But can you create more of a regional setup? We're already seeing it happen. So the people that thought, oh, I'm going to love this. This is awesome. Make good money. But you're gone every, like you're home once every six weeks. Okay. Well, that's not forever because again, industry shifts based off of supply and demand. So I just, yeah, I'm excited to see where your training goes. I think that's super smart and it'll be really beneficial too, especially as we have like more women in industry, which I think is phenomenal, different cultures coming into industry, which is also phenomenal. So again, just really, there's a lot of value there. It's really well done. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm I'm excited for, for what this is going to be in the future. And, you know, with Mohawk and their open and willingness to explore this and, and really take a chance on it. um, I think that we have an opportunity to really listen to the industry, which is, It sounds so simple and straightforward, but I feel like in a lot of respects, the industry is not listened to um, and, you know, actually do something that, you know, the industry needs and understand, you know, what it is that employers need. 
And, you know, we're looking at how we can implement onboarding programs into this and, and other types of training as well, other than just, you know, here's a course and take it. Um, you know, really looking at, you know, what is the point behind this? What are we trying to do? And then evolving our programming to match that. Very smart. Yeah, it's exciting. And I think, yeah, onboarding is another big word, like compliance, where it's like, mm -hmm. what goes into onboarding? You have your license. Here's your keys. It's like, nope. <laughs> yeah, so. no. but like even, even something as simple as what do you pack mm -hmm. for your truck, yeah. right? What do you do in your free time? How do you stay communicating with people in your life, with work, things like that? It seems so simple and obvious, but it's actually one of those things that lead to that lack of comfort going into it, right? So if you give them those tools and that information right at the very beginning, then they have the opportunity to plan and really consider ahead of time what they need and how to do it. Agreed. Yeah, the uh, you're eliminating the quote unquote dumb questions. Why would yeah. I ask that? That's a dumb question. It's like, no, no, it's a necessity. <laughs> yeah, but take you're right. the guesswork out of it. Correct. Very smart. No, that's exciting. Yeah, I can definitely see the reception from industry too, especially when like a smaller base carrier, which is a majority of our carriers out there, aren't necessarily investing or they don't have the time to invest into all of that research to give them the pamphlet to say, make sure on your first trip you do. It's like, no, no, okay. Well, we can team up with Minds for Matter. And I think that's exciting. Good job. Yeah, thank you. Good job. Absolutely. The uh, So something that you resonate or that you speak on that really resonates to me is the human element. And I mentioned that initially where I think that's something that as our industry shifts, hey, well, society shifts, I think we're focusing more on the who and less about the what at first. Who's the person? Who's Who works for the company? And I like that you're really in that space. And I like on your website how it says, make your business human. Can you kind of touch on what sparked that thought process? Like, how did that come to be? Yes. I, I, I love can. it. I love it. Like, it <laughs> it's very good. Thank you. Yeah. No, it, I think that's one of the things that we sometimes get away from in transportation is that we're all human. Um, so we know, we know what trucking is like, right? Working in a carrier environment, it's high stress, high volume with high stakes, and it's incredibly reactionary. So not only are you trying to do everything you can to service a client and be efficient and solve problems in real time as they happen, you also have to consider the safety of the driver, the safety of the public. And on top of that, you have to ensure that you're acting in conformity with what seems to be an endless amount of operational and compliance standards. And that has a lot of weight on a person. And you're demanded to carry that all day long. And a lot of time, all night long as well. It's one of those industries where it's very hard to leave things at the door. So it's tough to think conceptually and strategically and big picture when you are engrossed in the day-to-day. -day. So this is where I come in and the make business human thing comes into play. So I have three overarching service offerings that can be deployed individually or combined depending on your immediate or long-term needs. And they are specialized HR consulting, content creation, and then lastly, what I call process re-engineering. So first and foremost, Having to having to find procedures, processes, and policies help provide team members a pathway or a framework to make decisions that are accurate and reflect the corporate values and are in line with strategic goals of the business, right? As you said, right, the more experience you get, the more kind of, you know, one track mind you get on, okay, th this is the decision you make. Well, that's not exactly accurate, right? And that ebbs and flows over time. So I think having that framework in place actually helps you to make those decisions, but also decisions that, I, like I said, are in line with the values and the strategy of your business. And then I think they spend less time questioning their every move and they have a baseline to go off of when they're unsure of how to proceed. So, and then on top of that, obviously the specialized HR consulting, people issues, you know, a lot of times you need that independent third party who's a step back to say, 
here's what I think you should do, or here are your options, right? And I always say, I'm not a lawyer, right? I, I'm not an employment lawyer. I've worked with a lot of lawyers in the past, though. And I know generally what are your options for any specific HR type of engagement, right? Whether that's hiring, onboarding, performance management, or termination, right? Full cycle of employment. Um, and when you are in the day to day and when you have that kind of emotional connection to the situation, sometimes it's hard to make those calls one way or the other, right? The call that's the right for one for the person, but also the call that's right for the business. So I think having that independent third party is exceptionally important. And I've seen these types of environments get bred through things like um, I, one of the things I'm a part of is the Milton Chamber of Commerce HR Roundtable group of HR people. We've signed a confidentiality agreement and we can discuss what's going on in our business and actually get real and honest feedback from other HR people. So I kind of wanted to open that up to anybody who kind of needs that help. And then the last one is content creation. And that's where the actual training programs come into play. So you have these policies, you have these procedures, these processes, programming, you know, your HR stuff all defined, but it's not going to mean anything if anybody, if everybody doesn't know about it. <laughs> Absolutely. So how do you share that information? What is the optimal way to share that in and amongst all your team members? Um, so that's, that's that side of it. But then essentially all of that together, essentially what I do is I design tools and resources that help to alleviate the burden of involvement with every step of the operation right? The main goal of automating what you can and then allowing your team members to focus on activities that require more complex thought and action. And those activities are generally more engaging and rewarding too. So those people are more likely to stay as well, I think at the end of the day, right? And especially, and you know, this will, I, I'm sure we're going to talk about this a little bit further into the conversation, but that investment in your people, and, and you, don't, you don't need to necessarily invest money into certain things, but you have to invest the time into your people, the time for them to develop, right? And when they feel and sense that you are making that investment in them, they will make that investment in you. And I feel like that's where a lot of our challenges in terms of the labor pool and employment standards are coming into play right now. Yeah, I wanted to go there. I wanted to ask in sense of the word culture and how do you create a thriving culture? And I think you hit it on the head where if people feel valued, heard, their problems are heard and addressed, and there's actual movement in celebration, you can have a culture where people aren't thinking, oh, this sucks, I'm out of here. It's, oh, this is a big challenge. How do I overcome it? Or how do we overcome it? So how are you finding that when you're working with clients? Are they receptive? as a third party, if it's a content creation or if it's acting in HR, are they receptive to that? And are they seeing the benefit in their like realm of culture too? Yes. I think through the process that I take, what I'm trying to help leaders realize is that culture isn't built by a leader. It's built by the team. And so if you are a leader that says, okay, here's our values, here's our strategy, and our, our culture is just going to develop from there. No, it's not. If you don't have the buy-in from your team around you, that culture is just going to become toxic and it's not going to go in the direction that you want. Um, so I really feel like the culture is driven by the people and supported by the leadership. Yeah. So that's, that's what, that's what I kind of try to, that's what, that's, the understanding that I kind of try to get leaders to come to, especially when they approach me and say, okay, this is what I, this is what I think we need. And, you know, this is what we want. And, and, you know, th this is what we'll pay you to do it. And it's like, okay, I can do that. But can I spend a little bit more time asking why you want that? And then I go from there. Right. Good. Good. Yeah. That's really smart. And I like that quote, culture is not built by the leader. It's built by the team. Yeah. And when I'm thinking of retention too, again, just leaning on my own experiences, I loved being, well, I still do, being in, in, the, in environments where it's inclusive in the sense where what I have to say matters and yeah. you're part of a solution, you take that home with you too. And when you take it home nine times out of 10, you're telling your spouse, this is happening today. This is awesome. 
quitting isn't necessarily the dinner table topic anymore. It's more so like, hey, good job. Keep up the great work. So what's your take then? So when companies are onboarding and they're in this space, we'll stay on that topic. Culture is built by the team. Do you see the same? I guess, can you differentiate between a, a company that's full of hierarchy this is our onboarding process, do it my way. Or if it's like a team effort when they're onboarding, are you seeing the benefits there too? Um, Yes. So I definitely think that the onboarding program is probably one of the most important programs to have developed in your business. And I think that the biggest mistake that people make is that the onboarding process doesn't just last a week or two, specifically in the trucking space, right? Um, And especially if you are somebody who has no familiarity with the industry whatsoever. That first two weeks, I don't even know if you remember to screw your head on straight in the morning. You are getting bombarded by so much information, so many new things, so many new concepts to wrap your head around that really after those first couple of weeks, you're kind of just expected to to do your job and do it right and do it effectively. You know, I think we're setting ourselves up for failure in that respect. Um, And we're setting the people up for failure. Um, So I think that it is a mix of, um, uh, you know, short-term training, but also you need to pair that with a long-term coaching and mentoring strategy. And then that also feeds into your performance management program and your succession and your succession planning program. All of this ties into one. And if, the goals of your onboarding period and your onboarding program do not match the goals of your succession planning or your performance management program, you're not doing yourself any favors. Um, the perception of the industry coming into it can be very poor, right? So I think people have a perception in their minds coming into it that may not be correct. Okay, so I think it's also important to set people off on the right foot once they are recruited. So developing and focusing that onboarding program that is that is on the values and the strategies of the business, right? So then they can contribute to the culture the moment they step through the door of the business. So they know what the business is about. They know how their team operates and they are not stepping on toes trying to get to the point where they can be effective, right? Because I, I, I've seen that a lot as well, right? You know, with, um, you know, young people coming into the industry or students in co-op roles and things like that. They don't want to bother anybody, right? They don't want to step any toes. They don't want to make any mistakes. And so as a result, I feel like they don't get that level of comfort that I feel like they need to actually be effective. So, um, you know, I think being able to bridge that gap and also affording the time for it. Our operations, like I said, are high stress, high volume all the time. So if you don't have that time set aside to develop the people, they're going to get lost in the mix of everything, right? I think things like, so, and then kind of going on beyond that, having different coaches in the business that you know are great leaders that can support young people or new people in the industry to help them bring them along, right? Because you also have to consider that not everybody wants to be a leader or not everybody is a great leader, right? You have those people in your business that are really good at doing what it is that they do but trying to share that information outside of their brain is really difficult for them. So understanding that and using the people who are actually good at that and actually enjoy that to do those things. And then I think also giving opportunity for mentorship outside of a business. So within the industry, um, you know, sending them through different networking events and different learning programs, I think helps to build that network as well, right? People that they can lean on and call outside of their business are outside of their work um, that, you know, as kind of an ear, I think that's also exceptionally important to keep people engaged and motivated and to stay in the industry. Um, And then, like I said, having that defined succession planning, I feel like that's really important for somebody right on that first day to understand what is my growth potential and how do I get there? Yes. Right. Yeah. So I, then, yes. so then they can see what a future actually is in the industry. Right. Yeah. And I think that's really important for really anyone in their career, but I, I'm glad you touched on newer generations or younger people entering industry because that's going to be the next workforce. 
and the, maybe not 100%, but a lot. And having some form of vision, not guesswork, I think is really going to help that process. So when you're working with clients, and so I like that you talk about outside of the carrier, because some of my best growth has literally happened through associations, through law yeah. enforcement, and through people that I wouldn't never have expected they would want to basically mentor myself. So is that part of your, like when you're working with a client on onboarding, developing plans and programs and succession planning, is that part of your strategy is, okay, let's look outside of your little bubble and it's really focused on the fact that, okay, there's resources here. Let's connect the dots here. And, oh, they're really interested. And that's a big part of it. Yeah. I tie that into whenever I talk about succession planning in particular, right? Because when I think about it and when I think about recruiting strategies, and this is actually something that I do quite a bit of work on is recruiting strategies. Um, you, so when it comes to actually recruiting people and finding people, that takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of money, right? Um, and it's really hard, right? Especially considering if you are looking for a position that say is a higher up position and you are looking for a very specific set of skills. Um, and I also think that it's very competitive, right? Because our entire industry is trying to recruit from the same pool. Um, but it is my feeling and what I try to impart on my clients is that you should never have to recruit for a senior position. You should really only be recruiting for your entry level roles, right? So when somebody enters into your business, look at the skills and the experience that they have, look at their passions and help them to develop that and then identify areas for training, right? And this is where those outside opportunities come into play. So for example, you have a person, right? Okay. So we'll, we'll take my own, we'll take my own experience, for example, person like me, right? I came into transportation, safety and compliance, very entry level role. I had a little bit of familiarity, obviously, with the industry prior to that. Um, but I was new. I was green. Right. I had a lot to learn. But um, and I, I you know, one thing I, I never really reported through to my father. I always reported through other leaders. Um, so at the time it was the CFO and she recognized, OK, you like to write. You're exceptional at research and I can see what you are good at would you be interested in pursuing an HR de designation? And I said, absolutely, right? So you can recognize those traits in people before they're ready for a role. And that's when you need to do it because then you say, okay, so this person could potentially be a great manager, right? Let's, let's look at a dispatch, for example. Okay, this person could potentially be a great operations manager, but they're very great. What do we need to do to get them to that next level, right? So you can look at, at that point, you can look at the dispatcher training through KRTS. You can look at the OTA next gen program. You can look at you know, a CITT, like one of the designations from CITT. All of those different things could play into that, right? And that has to be a part of your strategy, right? You have to have those options. And then once you would make that investment in a person, that person's going to realize these people care. These people want to see me move and grow and become something. And so they're more likely to stay and they're more likely to put in the effort because you're putting in the effort. They see that there is growth opportunity for them. And that is the most important thing for a young person in a business. We are motivated to grow, but at the same time, we have literally operated in a school academic mindset being like, okay, you need to do X, Y, and Z, and then you go to the next step. You need to do X, Y, and Z, and then go to the next step. So why are we fighting against that frame of mind? We need to use that to our advantage. So if we have that defined in our succession plan, okay, you're here, but you want to get here, you need to do X, Y, and Z to get there. What's the response been like for the ownership and say management group that have implemented that and watch their team blossom and get a little higher energy? What's the reception been like? And I guess the feedback. It's been really great. Um, I've had a couple of people come back and say, you know, originally we did not believe what you were saying. <laughs> now we see it, right? Because in, in what I try to get to because, you know, with a lot of leaders, right, is your bottom line, your return on investment. 
And I always consider like, okay, so to recruit and onboard a new person, turnover costs a lot, right? You lose time, you lose money. And, you know, an onboarding period can cost somebody any, like any business between, you know, 10 and $20,000 in that first two weeks in time spent from other people. I, I feel like in a lot of cases, they don't really consider the expense of the labor of the people involved in the, in onboarding and training activities. So I, I try to focus on that. Okay. You're going to save money on your recruitment. And you're going to pay less to invest in training for a person. And my, I think one of my favorite ane- anecdotes that I've ever heard is, what happens if we invest in training and the people leave? Well, what happens if you don't and they stay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, that's eliminating the scarcity mindset too, where you're maybe you've been burnt in the past, but we do have a lot of entrepreneurs, small business owners in this environment, especially in transportation, they have the opportunity to grow. And I liked what you said too, when you're talking about recruit entry, but look within for your other leadership roles, because it's very true. People that understand your business, they care about your business. A lot of the times they can be molded. And then when they make a mistake, you work with them. And, but yeah, that's really smart. And I can see the positive flip side of someone being like, Oh, I don't know. To, oh, it's working. This is exciting. So yeah, that's really yeah, good. I, I see how much money that, you know, some of these transportation companies pump into recruitment and just putting up ads and things like that, right? Take that money that you are, because realistically, I actually don't like, I, and so many recruiters and marketers are going to like, <laughs> their heads are going to spin off their shoulders when I say this. I actually don't think you should spend any money on actually posting ads, right? You have social media now. You can build your presence a different way. You just have to be a little bit more focused on shifting that mindset away from that traditional recruitment because traditional recruitment doesn't work for us. It hasn't worked for a long time. The driver shortage has been a real thing for a long time. And it's not just the driver shortage anymore. It's talent in every department in a trucking business that is just desperate for talent. And I think that we are, it's just insanity. We're doing the same things over and over and over again, expecting different results. But we have an entire different generation that is now coming into the workforce who think a little bit differently. Um, You know, and I hate saying it, that influencer culture is real, Mm -hmm. right? Whether we like it or not, the nature of advertising and marketing and recruiting is changing. And if we don't adopt something that's similar to that influencer culture to actually communicate what this industry is about, we are not going to do ourselves any favors. Nobody is going to be interested in coming into this industry. Nobody is going to see the opportunity because right now, like really, when we look at it, the media is permeated by negative imagery associated with trucking, right? So right off the bat, we're fighting that. But if we can combat that negative media with positive media, even something as simple as sharing stories, sharing, you know, the innovation that's being worked on, you know, sharing the experience of different people working in the industry, that can get people thinking about your business and it will attract people to look at, okay, what opportunities are available? And I've been told so many times, oh, that, you know, that that's not actually the case. No, it is. It is. That's how yeah. young that's how young people now look at career paths. What they see influences what they do. Yeah. And it's not just putting out an, a job ad. Correct. I uh, that is actually something that a space that I live in quite frequently and I'm often I'm not ignorant to the fact that those that are probably creating these Facebook accounts or posting certain things maybe don't understand how to use say Canva or Grammarly or just the basic tools, but I'm like, that's your company right now. And I'm like, it's not to insult them. It's not saying I'm better than them. It's more so just a quick observation. And I'm like, yeah, there's a few things that you could have just tweaked. But yeah, I think story is really important and yeah, really highly. Yeah, I found like when I was doing that with One for Freight, um, right, being in HR, you're recruiting all the time. Um, and you know, 
I felt like I was bashing my head against the wall, you know, just posting on Indeed, posting on LinkedIn, things like that, and just not getting the response that I was looking for. So then I kind of pivoted and I started posting on social media a lot more, right? Not just about like, oh, you know, we're hiring this position, actually posting about people working in that position, right? I'm looking for drivers. I gave, you know, we give, um, uh, after truck world, during truck world, um, we had a couple, uh, one for freight, there was a couple of drivers because I still run the, the one for freight social media. Um, so a couple of the drivers, um, we're actually running the recruitment booth at truck world. So I gave the Instagram account to one of the drivers and said, post all day long. Right. And so he also sends me videos of stuff that's out on the road. And, you know, it, it, when we get new trucks, right. Post about that, you know, you have lunch in, in, you know, you have a potluck post about that, right? People actually want to be able to see that because I know when I look at businesses, I look at their social media and I say, hey, what, what's their culture like? Because that's really important. Now we're going back to that culture piece. If somebody can't see that in what you're putting out, they're not going to think, oh, is this, is this a great place to work? Do people actually enjoy to work there? But when they actually see people in their day-to-day -day work happy and doing things, right? That helps you be considered as you know, a great employer, that's a potentially great place to work. And like I said, it, it, it doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be anything, you know, well thought out or anything, just show what's real. Yes. That's all people care about. Yes. Agreed. Yeah. And that again, goes right to the who and less about the what. And it's funny. And I can tell, well, I'm grateful that you've been in podcasts and in different environments where you can speak before, because a lot of times the number one fear, aside from describing who they are, is perfectionism. And it's like, it's not about that. It's about, does this represent your company? So be professional, of course, but be real. And I think, yeah, the more you lean on your strengths of being real, and this is what our team goes through. And no, not every day is a good day, but we overcame this challenge today. It's just, it is naturally well more received. And it's funny that actually worked with, it works with the algorithms too. So the, uh, there's a lot of strategic thought behind that. So that's really good guidance. Right? And, th yeah. and those posts, you get the most engagement on. So you get the most traffic. And, and I think those things, you know, a, a lot of businesses don't understand. And the thing is, is social media is free. It doesn't that like, I mean, yeah, obviously you can invest in it, but it doesn't, you don't have to. Yeah, no, I agree. I try and advocate for that for carriers quite often is, do you have people on the road? Yes. Do they have an iPhone or an Android or something? Yes. Tell them to take pictures. Even if you want to channel it to one person, which is obviously what you're offering. Perfect. Because again, that just creates a totally different image, but your customers are seeing that too. And they're like, oh, hey, that's my freight. They're going to share it. Or, hey, that's tied down properly. Great. Like, so there's a lot of just, again, yeah. industry reciprocation there. Yeah. Like, you know, one of the things that I always try that I always say with clients is, is if you do things like, you know, if you do any charity moves, like with trucks for change or anything like that, make sure you're posting that, make sure people can see that because people, it, you know, because it's not bragging, it's, it's showing things that people want to be a part of. Yeah. yeah, no, I completely agree. And that's uh, so one of my favorite questions. Um, still have a couple of questions before we close, but one of my favorites is in regards to professional drivers. And I know you hit it earlier, so I, I really want to kind of highlight some space here is what would you say from a gratitude standpoint, you're most thankful for, for professional drivers? They're my favorite people to work with in the industry, to be honest. I don't know. I think that's actually the one thing that I truly miss about being in the carrier environment is the day-to-day -day interaction with the drivers. You know, they are the unsung heroes of our economy, really. I mean, and I think that became finally evident for people during the pandemic, right? When you see the supply chain, actually the impacts to the supply chain, right? When, you know, you're going into a grocery store and you're seeing empty shelves and then you realize just what these people do day in and day out. Because when you look at, because when you look at everything, you could look at everything around the room, everything, every component of everything that you are looking at at one point in time traveled on a truck with a driver and sometimes multiple, right? And I think it really goes to show just how important this type of work is 
And I don't think that we do a good enough job of celebrating them. We do things like National Truck Week and we do things like, you know, thank a trucker and stuff like that. And all of those things are great. I love celebrating them, right? But I think at the end of the day, we need to, I think we're doing a disservice by not changing the perception of that role and just how important it is, right? Because it's like any other trade, but it's not considered that way. And it should be, right? You know, when we're considering the amount of time that people spend outside of their homes and on the road. And, you know, when I, and see, when I see a truck on the road, I think, thank God. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, if it's bad weather, I get behind one. If there's traffic, I get behind one, right? Because I feel safe around them. That is not the reality for the majority of the public. So how do we start shifting that perception in the public? I feel like drivers have a lot to offer. I feel like their opinions need to be considered more when we are talking about things like changing legislation and employment standards and things like that, um, I feel like they have a lot to give. And the one thing that I find is we don't give them enough opportunity to share that. And that's what I try to do is I try to use what I can to share more from drivers directly, right? And whether that's, you know, interviewing them for courses or it's, you know, involving them in different events, inviting them to be speakers, um, and just even showing them that their input is valuable, that what they have to say is actually going to be considered, and then matching that with action. Huge. Yeah, I think that last part is key, too, because I'm a big believer in removing the just out of a job title. And when you have a culture, you're know, going right back to culture, but if you have an environment where you have a problem, the person with the answer is told, no, no, you're just so and so don't answer this question. You're going to install that in that human being to say, well, I'm not going to answer your questions. I'm not going to solve your problems because I'm just this. But the moment that you release that and you don't even allow that type of false identity to exist in a person, think of what they're going to help you overcome. And that could be personal life. That could be mentorship, friendship, that could be business, that could be customer salute. Like there are some of the greatest and yeah, I'm super like some of my greatest mentors still are professional drivers that are up against where I'm trying to help. And yeah, we do an over the road professional series, literally dedicated to professional drivers. So that way we can share their stories, their advice, mentorship, and just really uplift yeah. them as people because it's like, A, you're human, which again is super crucial, but the impact they have, like you said, on society, on our economy, on the supply chain, on the fact that you can get toilet paper when there's a toilet paper shortage, like it's just, yeah, I'm glad you have a world of respect from them. It's really good to see. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, and I've said this to a couple of friends um, over time and, you know, I was talking about it when I was out with a bunch of friends recently who none of them are in the industry, right? I'm the only one who's in the industry in that group. And I actually, and I can't remember exactly what we were talking about, but I said, oh, if I was ever put in that position, I would find a truck driver. And they all looked at me like, what? And I'm like, no, seriously, if I was ever someplace, oh, I remember what we were talking about. We were talking about all of what's going on in the GTA right now regarding the carjackings. And I said, if I was ever put in that position, or if I was ever someplace that I felt uncomfortable, I would park next to a truck. I would find a truck driver. That would be what I would do if ever I needed help. And they looked at me and they were like, but why? And I'm like, because they're the people who are most likely to help you. Right? Like we, I think about things like, you know, truckers against trafficking. And I, you know, we hear those stories on the road, right? Like, you know, every year the highway angels and, you know, the driver awards and things like that. Like those stories are exceptionally important, right? Because I think they really do demonstrate the majority of the industry and the driving population. Those are the people that are going to go above and beyond to make sure that somebody is safe. They're also the ones that are going to recognize things that are happening before they happen because of everything that they see on the road, right? They know they can sense when something's wrong or not right and they can help and they will, right? So, so that's something I feel like, you know, we as an industry need to do a better job of communicating. Um, I think that, you know, drivers are like, they're heroes. 
they're the angels of the road, essentially. Like if I was ever in an accident or anything, that's who would I, that's who I would want to stop to help me. Powerful. Powerful. Those that are listening, hop on YouTube. <laughs> just because the passion in your face, I'm like, don't get emotional. <laughs> but I just really admire your advocacy. I think it's really powerful and it's not spoken about enough. That's why I have a couple of staple questions that I like to finish interviews with. And this is one of them, because I think you really get to, to really know someone when they talk about something and people in general that they really care about. So it's really nice to see the, mm -hmm. um, so when we're thinking about, and so I'll use the, I use the word legacy all the time, pivotal impact, creating an impact, that kind of language. And when you're thinking about your day-to-day -day interactions, you enter a room, you have a good meeting, you have a good conversation, good coffee with a friend, whatever you leave. Are you consciously aware of the impact that you're having? Like, are you, cause I can tell you're a leader. I can tell that you're confident and you really enjoy creating like change. And part of that's through education and knowledge, but a lot of it, I think is just living. And when you're an intentional person that lives a certain way, like success leaves clues. So I think that's really admirable. So I just, yeah, that's my observation, but you're, how do you process that? Are you someone that's like, I am who I am. Or are you like, no, no, I'm going to go into this meeting and I'm going to ensure people are impacted. Like, how do you process that as a leader? This is a really interesting question um, because I actually do struggle with certain things. Um, I'm a very confident person. I'm a very confident speaker. I like to call myself an extroverted introvert, um, you know, where I can, you know, hermit and be a homebody, you know, nine days out of 10. When I go out in that social sphere, I'm out there, right? You, you know, I'm there and I'm not scared to share my opinion or, um, you know, network, talk, listen, those kinds of things. Like the, the networking side of the industry, I absolutely love. For me, my struggles over time has always been coming, you know, stepping back and being like, was that genuine? Can I, it, you know, how can I be empathetic here? Um, and I think that's what I overthink sometimes. Um, you know, over time, I definitely think that I've grown that skill. Um, but that's always something that that has been kind of at the forefront of my mind. Um, and I can be very emotional. And that's not a bad thing. You know, I think, uh, you know, particularly with female professionals in the industry, um, you know, that, that emotional uh, tag that you, you get, uh, you know, a lot of us fight against that. And I fought against that for a really long time, but I think over time, I realized that no, my emotion is what makes me good at what I do, right? It helps me to consider the feelings of everybody involved. And, you know, I, I, I say, I constantly live in the gray area, right? Because I can understand and why I may, why I may not personally agree with one side or the other, I can understand where everybody is coming from. And I feel like that speaks to my personality and my ability to be empathetic. Um, and, and I find that not a lot of people, you know, think that way or ask those types of questions. So instead of trying to fight that emotional quality, I've embraced it. And I definitely think that that has changed my leadership for the better. Yeah. Um, that being said, I think I have, you know, I, I have that perfectionist quality. It, it makes me grit my teeth, right? Because you know, you're never going to be perfect and it doesn't have to be perfect because it can evolve over time, right? You know, put it out there, see what you have to change and then you can change it. Out. Um, but I really have to, um, I really have to actually fight that, I guess. Like I have to actually, you know, use that to my advantage. Yeah. You mentioned empathy. So have you heard the expression empathy over tyranny? Yes, I have. Yeah. I'm a big believer in that where it's like, okay, let's put away the whip and let's just be where people are. And when you can actually understand yourself, I think that's really important, but you also hit, hit on another thing that I think is really important in leadership and that self-reflection through conversation and adjusting as the conversation goes on. So if you're really high energy and the room is not necessarily high energy, you're aware of it so yourself, but you can adjust. But I think a lot of times, especially high stress, tons on the go, people get really temperamental. And when you're able to adjust and hold that in and say, 
okay, I'm hot right now. I'm just going to take a deep breath. You can still navigate through processes. I think those are good skill sets. But yeah, you crushed that question. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Um, no, I think for me, right, like it's it's definitely been a journey, right? You're constantly growing as a leader. You're constantly growing as a person. Um, you know, I think about when I started in the industry, you know, better part of a decade ago. And I think about, you know, it, who I, the person I was then and the person I am now, and and I was eight different people in between there, <laughs> right? You know, so and I and I think I'm going to be a different person six months a year down from now. Like I, I feel myself growing in that respect, and you know, and I think that that's something that we need to make, particularly young people, understand that that's okay. Yeah. Like you are okay. If you don't like who you are now, don't worry, you're going to work on that and you're going to develop and, you know, you may not consciously do it, but you will. And, you know, sometimes you are going to be in a negative mindset. Sometimes you're going to be in a positive mindset and that changes who you are and that changes your work and that changes, you know, what it is that you're doing, but that's okay. You are human, right? Work isn't everything, Right. Your career doesn't define who you are. It supports it, but it doesn't define who you are. So you can be whoever you want to be. And I know that sounds so cheesy, but like, but really, right? Like, you know, I find that I used to take things very personally, right? When things would go wrong, right? I would look at all the different things that I did wrong in that situation and, you know, what I could have done better, but I, I didn't really focus on okay, but that's done now to move on. And then on the other hand of that, right, when things went well, I didn't take the time to celebrate them. And I think that really negatively impacted my overall happiness. So once I took the moment to actually step back and be like, no, you accomplished that and you need to celebrate that. Then I actually started to shift away from that kind of glass half empty mindset. And actually it was at that point that I really started doing things that were meaningful, having a meaningful impact on the people that I was around. Right. You know, I was coming out of that HR role and I said to myself, I finally understand how to talk to people and be empathetic. Right. Like, you know, so I think it's all, you know, hindsight's always 2020. Right. But, um, yeah, I, I think it's just important to recognize that, you know, you're still growing, you're constantly growing, right? Like, and it, it doesn't have, that's not a bad thing. Right. Yeah, the, especially as more of our younger generation, like, I'm assuming we're both millennials, I am, so I think we're similar, yeah, so that's one thing, but then the Gen Zs, and I don't even know what happens after Gen Z, but being mindful of that, but I think empathy is huge. And I think empathy will be the greatest superpower that a lot of just operational leaders, organizational leaders, boots on the ground, like frontline workers can all really kind of say, okay, how can I be empathetic in this situation? Because we're all going through a lot. We're all processing change. And when you have generational differences, that's really important. So but yeah, I'm, uh, I'm just really grateful. I think we, uh, we crushed a lot today. I got really actually lost in the conversation, which I really like where I'm like, you're teaching me, like keep feeding me. This is really good. So as we do come to an end, can you just, again, give a recap of where people can go to learn a li little bit more about yourself, obviously minds for matter and yeah, we'll close up. Perfect. Yeah, no. Um, so you can find uh, minds for matter on most social media platforms and uh, my website is www.mindsformatter.com with an S. I always have to say that. Um, but yeah, I mean, really, I think what I want to end on um, is actually, it's a, it's a conversation that I had with a couple of colleagues um, uh, last week when we were at Women With Drive. And it's this focus on, rather than focus on that, you know, trying to get people to match the culture that currently exists in trucking, right? You know, we all worked, you know, as millennials, we all were subject to that grind culture. We all went through those 12, 14 hour days when we started out, we were working all night. We were working on the weekends. We couldn't go out without worrying or profusely checking our emails to make sure that everything is going right. And we couldn't relax we can't expect the next generation to do that. It's not fair. We know what it leads to. 
We know it leads to burnout. We know it leads to people leaving the industry. We know it deal, it leads to poor mental health and poor decision-making. So why are we perpetuating that? We have a real opportunity here to shift away from that grind culture. And I feel like the more millennials get into these leadership roles, we need to focus on what we know to be effective. And what we know isn't effective is driving people to grind like that. Great, powerful, powerful. Yeah, that, that's a wonderful way to close. And I won't lie, the segue should be, you wanna come back? Because I think talking about that and talking in that direction of industry, A, it's not talked about enough, and, but B, it's the reality that we, we need to face. But if we can be ahead of that curve, I think a lot of organizations would really benefit from that. Because yeah, the whole work till you're dead mentality. It's like, no, I got other things to do with my life too. Thanks. So, but yeah, it's a, that's a really great way to, again, that's a great segue into that ask. So the invite is definitely there and I'm, I'll speak on behalf of our listeners that they're going to say, yes, please come back. So just, again, I'm just super grateful, highly recommend that you connect with Stephanie, definitely check out Minds for Matter and just, yeah, thank you so much again for hopping on the podcast. This was really fun. Yes. Thank you. And I would love to come back. Okay, good. <laughs> awesome. Okay, we'll enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> yes, you as well, Josh, and we'll talk soon. We're good. Stephanie, honestly, thank you so much for taking the time, joining me on the Truck Focus podcast, but more so for the mission that you're on to really help bridge the gaps in transportation. So I really appreciate the guidance that you shared throughout our conversation to a point where I caught myself just listening and learning. It was awesome. And you really hit the nail on the head when you broke down the importance of keeping your retention needs at front of mind during your onboarding journey. Huge advice. And I really think that could be applied in a lot of businesses in our industry, but also it's a huge takeaway for our listeners in our community to consider in their own workplaces. So I'm a strong believer that in order to act, we need clarity on what it is we need to be doing. So in order to do so, then we can create that pivotal impact, which is to intentionally help others, to intentionally be empathetic about a situation, but also how we can provide solutions for such challenges. And as I reflect on our conversation today, Stephanie, I just appreciate your leadership, really appreciate the just the confidence that you speak with and the advice that you shared and how focused you are in helping improve just organizations and people in our industry, really value your mission. So I highly recommend that our listeners do learn more about Stephanie and my Minds for Matter by visiting mindsformatter.com or checking them out on all major social media platforms. I've included links in the show notes. So before we end today, I did want to take a quick moment just to continue to say thank you. So if this is the first time you've ever joined our community, listen to the podcast, I really welcome you. And to our dedicated listeners, I just want to continue to say thank you so much for your investment of time but also for really implementing just the knowledge that our industry leaders like Stephanie do share. So that way, again, we're creating a better industry each day. So at the beginning of our interview, I did challenge you to consider what part of our conversation created an impact or could create an impact in your journey. So again, I do ask that you let me know. So if it's putting it in the comment, if it's sending me a message, sending me an email, my contact details, of course, are in the show notes. And I just really appreciate it because again, I like understanding where our audience is at, where our community is growing. And it really does help me go back and forth like that. So I do ask that you do that, but also ask that you share this episode out. So if this episode was like, oh, this is exactly what I needed to hear, or oh, my workplace could really use this advice. I just ask that you simply share it out, but also that you like it. Because again, we, we track everything and then good engagement's always encouraging, but more so that you've just subscribed to the channel you're listening on. So that way you're notified of all upcoming content as we do release content weekly. And to be super excited, we even have more content coming. I'm just super grateful for our industry leaders that are stepping up. So stay tuned for that. But again, just thank you so much to our community. Stephanie, thank you so much again for your time. Just super grateful. As always, let's create a pivotal impact. <laughs>